Hi everyone, welcome to Inside Archaeology, where we dig deep into the world of heritage and the discoveries that are rewriting history. My name is Rachel and I'm an archaeologist. I've excavated in the Kingdom of Jordan, Canada and the UK. Features for this month include the results of new DNA sequencing of Utsi the Iceman, the smell of recreated Egyptian mummification bombs, and the horrific theft of more than 1,500 artifacts from the British Museum. All the links to further details on the stories mentioned today will be in the description below if you would like more info on them. Before we begin, I spend hours researching, writing, filming, and editing my videos, so if you like it, please give it a thumbs up. Or, if you're feeling generous, you can go to my Ko-fi page and buy me a Sharpie, the quintessential writing implement all archaeologists constantly restock as they lose them in the field all over the world. Taking a few seconds to subscribe to this channel or like one of my videos really helps support me in keeping the channel going. It tells the algorithm to promote it to new audiences, meaning that the channel can continue to grow and provide quality heritage content. Okay, let's dig in. We have eight stories today in our top discoveries segment, which I will cover in chronological order, starting with discoveries dating the farthest back in time. We begin today with what is possibly the oldest site occupied by humans in North America. Archaeologists at the University of Oregon have been excavating at Rim Rock Draw Rock Shelter in Burns, Oregon since 2011. It is a Paleo-Indian open air site, meaning that the early inhabitants took advantage of the protection from the elements offered by a shallow overhang in an otherwise open landscape. In 2012, the team found a finely crafted orange agate scraper with preserved bison blood residue and camel teeth fragments under a layer of volcanic ash from an eruption of Mount St. Helens that happened over 15,000 years ago. Since then, the remains from three different Ice Age animals and another scraper buried even deeper in the ash have also been found. The enamel of the camel teeth was sent for radiocarbon dating and has now yielded a result of 18,250 years before present, making Rimrock Shelter one of, if not the oldest, human occupation site in North America. The stratigraphy of the soils suggested that the scrapers are even older than both the volcanic ash and the camel teeth. Additional testing of other camel and bison teeth fragments is currently underway, and the researchers are also studying plant remains from cooking fires. If the testing results of the additional material yield similar dates to the camel teeth, it would place human occupation of North America even earlier than previously thought. Our next story is from the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region in China, where archaeologists working in Qifeng have discovered a dragon made of mussel shells from the early Neolithic Hongshan culture that dates to between 4700 to 2900 BCE. Among its many contributions to ancient Chinese civilization, Hongshan culture is perhaps best known for its exquisite jade carvings, including an iconic C-shaped jade dragon, which this particular find actually predates. Unlike the later jade dragon, this artifact is pieced together from several muscle shells that form its head, body, and tail, and it measures about 20 centimeters long. The entire structure reflects a keen understanding of anatomy and a commendable appreciation of art. It was found alongside two fragments of Hongshan pottery. It is a significant discovery that fills a gap in archaeologists' knowledge of the dragon symbol within the Hongshan culture. The mussel shell dragon differs greatly from the previously discovered jade dragon in terms of carving techniques and styling. It is more delicate and realistic, and the teeth, tail, and other parts of the carving are subtle. The body shape is spread out and not curled into a C shape, making it the only uncurled Hongshan dragon figure that has been found so far. It was thought that previously discovered Hongshan jade artifacts were placed at high-grade ritual buildings or ritual sites, while the dragon unearthed here during the current excavation is a clue to the spiritual world of people living in lower-grade settlements. This distinction underscores the cultural diversity and societal stratification of the Hongshan culture, presenting a richer tapestry of their way of life, rituals, and beliefs. Now we go to Tyrol in Italy, where DNA analysis has presented new insights into the life of Utzi, the mummified mountain man discovered in an alpine glacier in 1991. Directly dated to 3350 to 3120 BCE, his discovery quickly made him a sensation, and modern recreations have depicted him with long, unkempt hair and pale skin. These interpretations arose in part from genetic sequencing of his remains back in 2012. 
Now, a study published in Cell Genomics details the results from a higher quality resequencing of his DNA, which has shown that these interpretations were likely incorrect. The 2012 analysis had suggested that Utsi had pale skin, brown eyes, and steppe ancestry. The ancestry in particular was surprising, as other research had suggested that steppe people weren't present in Europe until 1,000 years after Utsi died. However, it was known that the genome wasn't sequenced perfectly. Since 2012, ancient DNA technology has improved markedly, hence the reasoning for the new study. The results from this latest sequencing show that the steppe ancestry probably stemmed from modern DNA contamination. Instead, this team found an astonishing level of Anatolian farmer ancestry, hinting that Utsi's lineage was genetically isolated from other Europeans at the time. Skin pigmentation markers revealed that he had much more melanin in his skin than expected, making him darker than modern Sicilians. He also carried genetic markers for male pattern baldness. Considering his age and the missing hair on his mummified remains, this means that he was probably balding when he died. These results are a much better match for the dark coloration of his skin and lack of hair seen on the mummified remains, traits which had previously been attributed to an unknown darkening effect from the ice and the disintegration of his hair, despite the fact that other similar organic materials like his clothes survived. This discovery has not only solved the question of the steppe ancestry, but also provided further details into Utsi's story. Although it does mean that the modern model of him in the South Tyrol Archaeological Museum can no longer be viewed as an accurate representation. The museum is aware of the study's results, but currently has no plans to replace the current model, which features heavily on their marketing material. Our next story is from Egypt, where researchers have recreated one of the scents of mummification bombs used in 1450 BCE. This was done by scraping residues from now empty canopic jars that once contained the mummified lungs and liver of the noble lady Senetne, the wet nurse of the long awaited son and heir of Pharaoh Tutmosa III, the future Pharaoh Amenhotep II. The jars were originally found by Howard Carter, yes, that Howard Carter, in Kings Valley Tomb 42. The mummified organs have been lost, but the residues of the mummification bombs are partially preserved as thin coatings on the walls and bases of the jars, as well as permeating into the porous limestone of which the jars are made. Several advanced mass spectrometry techniques to reconstruct the substances, revealing that the bombs consisted of a mixture of beeswax, plant oil, fats, bitumen, large tree resins, a balsamic substance, and damar tree resin. These are the richest, most complex bombs yet identified in this early time period, and they shed light on the ingredients for which there is limited information in Egyptian textual sources. They highlight the myriad trade connections of the Egyptians in the second millennium BCE through the use of imported ingredients, namely the larch and damar resin, as well as Senetne's status as a key member of the pharaoh's inner circle. The team then worked closely with a perfumer and sensory museologist to meticulously recreate the scent based on their analytical findings. Coined the scent of the eternity, the ancient aroma will be presented at the Moesgaard Museum in Denmark in an upcoming exhibition, offering a unique multi-sensory experience which allows visitors to connect with the past in a uniquely olfactory way. Now we go to Peru, where a 3,000-year-old tomb has been unearthed during excavations in the Pacopampa archaeological zone. Located in northern Peru and 2,500 meters above sea level, the Pacopampa site was used from 1200 to 500 BCE. It includes nine monumental ceremonial buildings of carved and polished stone, and it is thought to be a large ceremonial center mostly associated with the Chavin culture, an extinct pre-Columbian civilization that emerged in the northern Andean highlands of Peru between 900 and 200 BCE. The burial was found one meter deep in the ground in a large circular pit nearly two meters in diameter beneath six layers of ash mixed with black earth. The skeleton was found lying face down with crossed legs. Among the artifacts buried with the body, which were also intentionally placed upside down, were a bowl embellished with carved lines and a decorated stamp, which would have been dipped in paint and used to adorn the bodies of elite people with ritualistic symbols. Two other seals were also found, one of which depicts an anthropomorphic face design, while the other has a jaguar design. 
The funerary context corresponds to the pre chavang Pakopampa I phase and dates from around 1200 BCE. The archaeologists think the tomb occupant was potentially a religious leader and have dubbed him the priest of Pakopampa. More DNA discoveries bring us next to Iraq and Denmark, where for the first time, researchers have successfully extracted ancient DNA from a 2,900-year-old clay brick. Currently housed at the National Museum of Denmark, the brick comes from the palace of Neo-Assyrian king Ashurnasirpal II, whose palace construction began around 879 BCE. The brick has a very useful Akkadian cuneiform inscription stating that it is the property of the palace of Ashurnasirpal, king of Assyria, which makes it possible to date the brick precisely to within a decade. During a digitization project, the researchers extracted DNA from the inner core of the brick to avoid modern DNA contamination by adapting a protocol previously used for other porous materials such as bone. The resulting DNA sequence identified 34 distinct taxonomic groups of plants including cabbage, heather, birch, laurels, umbellifiliers, and cultivated grasses. This research serves as proof of concept and method, which could be applied to many other archaeological sources of clay from different places and time periods around the world. Helping to provide more information on past flora and fauna would help us recreate descriptions of ancient biodiversity that could be a valuable tool to better understand and quantify present-day biodiversity loss. Next, we head to Pompeii in Italy, where archaeologists have discovered a small bedroom that was almost certainly used by slaves in the Civita Giuliana Villa, which is around 600 meters north of Pompeii. The room contained two beds, only one of which had a mattress, two small cabinets, and a series of urns and ceramic containers in which the remains of two mice and a rat were found. There were no traces of grates, locks, or chains to restrain the room's inhabitants. This discovery sheds light on the lowly status of slaves in the Roman world and illustrates that control of them was probably primarily exerted through the internal organization of servitude, rather than through physical barriers or restraints. Our last discovery for this month could have also easily fit in as our first oldest story, as it features a 66 million year old dinosaur bone, which was probably part of an ancient Roman fossil hunter's collection. The vertebra from a plesiosaur was found in the north of Cambridge among a number of Roman items, including pottery and animal bones, which date from the mid second to the late fourth century CE. The bone was worn in places, suggesting that it had been handled often in the past. This evidence shows that the Romans found fossils, but you can only imagine what they might have thought that they had. The items from the archaeological dig, including the bone, will eventually be given to Cambridgeshire County Council once they have been cleaned and recorded. Personally, I think this discovery is a great interaction between paleontology and archaeology, two similar disciplines investigating very different eras of the past, which people often think are the same. For once, when people ask these archaeologists if they've ever found dinosaurs, they can say yes. That's it for our top discoveries for August. Now we're going to move on to current news and events. The biggest archaeology headline of August was undoubtedly the news of the theft and sale of British Museum artifacts by a senior curator. I'm going to do a separate video digging into this story once more information has come to light. So I'm just going to do a quick summary here for you today. Senior curator of Greek collections, Greek sculpture, and the Hellenistic period, Peter Higgs, is accused of taking more than 1,500 separate artifacts from the museum's collection and selling them on eBay for a fraction of their estimated value. One Roman object dating back more than 2,000 years and valued at up to 50,000 pounds was allegedly sold for just 40 pounds. Higgs is alleged to have removed the items without detection for many years, with artifacts from the collection appearing on eBay as far back as 2016. The museum was alerted to the thefts several years ago by external antiquities dealers who recognized some of the items for sale. However, they only began an internal investigation two years after they were initially informed. Higgs was dismissed earlier in 2023, and the museum director, Hartwig Fisher, has resigned over the mishandling of the entire situation. As far as I could find, Higgs has not yet been formally arrested or charged by police, and his family have denied the allegations. I've seen a lot of internet comments on the irony of the situation when one of the reasons the British Museum uses to justify keeping their contested items is that they keep them safe. The museum administration should definitely be held to account for their part in this whole situation 
But I also want to say that it's been really disheartening to see people kind of like rejoicing or reveling in the fact that these artifacts were stolen and or implying that the museum is getting a taste of its own medicine. I want to point out that instead of being stored somewhere where people could access and use these items for research, a lot of these artifacts are now gone forever. Tracing them and getting them back will cost a lot of money and time that the museum probably doesn't have, and it is a process that could take decades. Some of the items have even probably already been melted down and destroyed. This entire thing has undermined the reputation of all museums and their staff, who would never do this kind of thing, as well as resulting in the loss of irreplaceable artifacts. Hopefully, at the very least, this will result in development of better practices for keeping collections safe from this kind of thing happening again. I will keep you updated as the story develops. In happier news, the world's first deep water archaeological park has been opened for divers off the coast of Zlendi in Malta. Encompassing a 67,000 meter square area of significant archaeological value, the archaeological zone at sea was designated in 2020 and offers researchers and technical divers from around the world the opportunity to explore Malta's rich history beneath the sea. The park's depth ranges between 105 and 115 meters, and the seabed consists of fine silt and sand punctuated by a series of rocky outcrops formed by extinct coral reefs. Around these outcrops are concentrations of archaeological objects, mostly amphora. It is highly likely that more archaeological remains are buried in the sediment. The park can also be accessed via a virtual museum as the bottom of the sea was mapped out following extensive work by Heritage Malta's Underwater Cultural Heritage Unit. There is a link to the virtual museum website in the description below if you're interested. Although the depths at which the park is found make it accessible only to a niche of technical divers, the virtual museum brings the discoveries closer to specialized audiences and the general public. That's the end of our current news and events. We'll close our program today talking about archaeology in entertainment slash pop culture, so movies and stuff. For those of you following the development of Gal Gadot's Cleopatra movie, she gave a brief update while speaking to Flaunt magazine saying that she didn't want to rush it and wanted to give Cleopatra the time and care she deserves in order to get the movie right. I'm sure it also doesn't help that the writer's strike has put a pause on development. For British archaeology lovers, Time Team have unveiled plans for a monthly release schedule on their YouTube channel, combining new content with classic episodes from Time Team's 30-year catalog. All right, everyone, that's everything for the August edition of Archaeology News. What was your favorite story from this month? Is there anything important that I missed? Let me know in the comments down below. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. If you have any stories you think should be featured on next month's show, feel free to send them to me via DM on Instagram at Inside Archaeology. Don't forget to support me with a like or subscribe before you go. Thank you so much for watching, especially if you've made it all the way to the end, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!